Welcome everyone to today's episode of Getting In a College Coach Conversation. I'm Sally Ganga from College Coach. This is a tough time for everyone, but remember that we're all in the same boat. I get a lot of questions about how colleges will react to the coronavirus disruptions. And again, since we're all going through it, they will understand. So please don't worry about the fact that you had to drop your community service or other activity that took you out of the home. Now on to our show for our last segment, Alex Bickford, College Coach uh, Finance Consultant, will be telling us about maximizing college saving plans to pay the college tuition bill. But first, um, as you can see on the film, if you're, if you're uh, watching this in video form, I will be welcoming Dr. Paul LeBlanc, President of Southern New Hampshire University. Southern New Hampshire has had a remarkable trajectory under his leadership, growing from 2,800 students to over 135,000 learners and becoming the largest nonprofit provider of online higher ed in the country. And it was number 12 on Fast Company Magazine's World's 50 Most Innovative Companies list, and that's the only university included. So Dr. LeBlanc is a pretty ideal person to talk to us about the challenges and disruptions being faced by higher, ed higher education due to COVID-19 and how those disruptions might be creating opportunities for institutions and students. So Dr. LeBlanc, thanks so much for being here today. Sally, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be here um, talking to you. So I was wondering if you could first just kind of introduce yourself a little. I gave a little bio, but sort of what's a little bit of your background in, in higher ed, just kind of a thumbnail uh, introduction. Well, you didn't ask, but I'm going to go way back because I'm going to set point out that uh, my family immigrated when I was four. So I'm an immigrant. I'm a first generation college goer. Um, I was able to go to college in an era when I could get high quality but affordable college mm -hmm. and it changed the whole trajectory of my life. And I sometimes fear that for too many Americans, they're being left behind that that version of the American dream. I know it can sound a little hokey, but it was my lived experience. And the passion that really fuels me in terms of this work is to make sure that we're making that available to the next generation of young people uh, in the United States. So my own journey is, you know, um, coming under the, the guidance of amazing uh, high school teachers and then uh, college faculty. And, you know, I worked construction every summer to get through college. And uh, in my senior year, my great mentor said, so what do we think about grad school? I was like, I'm not thinking about grad school. Like, who goes to grad school? <laughs> He's like, you're going to grad school. And, you know, in a kind of 11th hour way, she helped me make that happen. And it reminded me that for a lot of people, there's a kind of poverty of aspiration. There's certainly a poverty of finance, um, but poverty of, you know, a sense of what's possible. And she widened my sense of what was possible. So I went on to graduate school, did a doctorate at UMass Amherst, and became a faculty member at Springfield College and was working in technology. So I've always had an interest in technology. And then so I did a detour. And it's interesting when I talk to people about career paths because they're not usually even, they're not a smooth trajectory, right? So my, my sideline was for three years, I took a leave of absence from higher ed, or from academia at least, and went to work for Hope Mifflin Publishing and led a technology startup for them. And I learned a lot and then came back and I was president of Little Marble College, a idiosyncratic little progressive liberal arts college in the foothills of Vermont. And then 17 years ago came to Southern Hampshire University. So I have to say, start. Yeah, I was just going to say, I know Marlboro, I went to Reed College and I had oh. friends who transferred to Marlboro because Reed was too conventional, which is, tells you something about Marlboro. Right. Um, and <laughs> so I can't imagine two institutions that are more different, but I think it it's, says something about how great the landscape is in the United States, that you have two different, two institutions that are so different because they're really, it's all about finding the right place for the different students. Oh, and so many other varieties, right? Mm -hmm. Faith-based institutions, the military mm -hmm. academies, research one institutions, you know, big sprawling public flagships like Madison, right, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the Marlboros of the world or the NESCAC schools, you know, the Bates, Bowdens, Colby's, mm -hmm. um, the former friend schools, you know, mm -hmm. Haverford, Bryn Mawr, Earlham. Uh, yeah, I think it's one of the great delights of higher education in America that there's probably a school for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We just have to make them more affordable. We have to keep it within reach. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about my own experience. I mean, I, I think I went to college after you did, but I'm still, I'm so grateful that I was able to get this top-notch education. And 
I did borrow money, but it was less than 20,000. I mean, I tell students, I drove a used car for a long time. That was the, that was the sacrifice I made. That is a so reasonable of a sacrifice. You yeah, know, for sure. yeah, and it's especially just, for what hap, you know, what it gives you, right? Well, and exactly. The, and that's the interesting calculus because I think we're having this, you know, the question of affordability and debt and how much debt is so much more complicated than sometimes our political debates would suggest. So when I think about debt, I think, you know, if someone is graduating and has a real calling to be an early childhood educator, they should have like no debt. Mm -hmm. Like you, you'll never be able to make enough to pay it back. And if we should help them do that because we need great childhood uh, educators. We also need to pay them more than we do typically, I would argue. On the other hand, if someone borrows thirty and even $40,000 with a computer science degree and lands mm -hmm. a job at Google that starts at 80, mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty good calculus. You're mm -hmm. going to be in a good position to pay that back. So as we often, you know, as research tells us, choice of major is almost more important than choice, choice of school. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of complicated calculus about what what's the lifetime impact of debt is really critical. Mm -hmm. And what's also, calc um, I think, complex, too, is people might start in engineering and transfer out. And then when That's they right. transfer into, and you know, English or history or early childhood education, um, yep. that changes the calculus. So, um, yeah, it really sort of argues for trying to lower the cost, as you've done at Southern New Hampshire. Um, I want to, and, and, and I'm, I'm, you can definitely weave that in, but I would like to kind of dive into the challenges that Southern New Hampshire and other institutions are going through right now, like the kind of disruptions due to COVID-19. And, and please do weave in like issues of cost um, sure. to that as well. Well, like everybody else, so we, people are more likely to know us nationally for our online programs. And as you mm -hmm. said in your introduction, they're very large. I think, um, we in WGU are probably the two largest schools now in the country. Um, but we also have a campus and that campus of about 4,000 students are grappling with, is grappling with every, you know, all the same issues that everybody mm -hmm. else is. Now we made an early decision not to open in the fall. Um, and in some ways that made our life easier because we weren't planning for both scenarios. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of schools announcing that they are going to open and now they're backtracking because I think part of their one of the bets they were making is that by now we would be wrestling the pandemic under control. And in fact, it's gone the other way. So mm -hmm. as we know, we're seeing a kind of uncontrolled uh, pandemic in the United States, especially compared to other developed economies. So, so our job is a little bit easier because our faculty and our staff could early on really start focusing on what does it mean to teach remotely, support students remotely, um, give them as much of what they get in a campus experience developmentally speaking it's not the same right you're not living in the dorm you're not staying up till two in the morning with a whole bunch of friends mm -hmm. talking about the meaning of life um, it's not the same sense of belonging and you're not out from under your parents roof probably either mm -hmm. um, so so we've wrestled with that we're lucky enough to be in a strong financial position that we could do that mm -hmm. um, but I think probably almost as important was our decision to um, announce our decision to by September of 21 lower our campus-based tuition from $32,000 a year to 10. Mm -hmm. And it's a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, and we have a lot of people trying to figure out how to make that work. And we have meetings all, you know, every week and task forces working on that. So what we've said is for this year's incoming freshmen, you already get the $10,000 rate right? and we're going to give you a full scholarship because you're taking a bet on us. You don't mm -hmm. know what next year is going to look like. Mm -hmm. Our returning students will also uh, have options in that sense, but, but everyone's remote this, 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 first, this first year. Mm -hmm. freshmen. Um, yeah. So the entire year, not even the, you're oh, not- I, I misspoke. We have announced okay. through the fall semester, mm -hmm. um, and if conditions are not significantly better than they are now, and we can talk about what that's, what's, you know, because it's not just what is the state of the pandemic, it's what's the availability of testing, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other things. Um, so for the same situation, sure, almost inevitably it will be a year. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, um, but it's not very promising at the moment. I know I might be being Pollyannish, but I've really been hoping for like spring semester. Like that's what things are. I know, are. I know. <laughs> People are desperate. We're all desperate to get back, you know. Yeah. I was on um, a call last night with a group of our undergraduates and they're just great. A reminder, like I miss them so much after getting like, I was like, 
it reminded me how great they are. Like, I, you know it intellectually, but we've been all heads down this summer. Um, and they're desperate to get back. But mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. Yeah, there is, there is something. Um, I think the availability of online education is so crucial and helpful, but there is something special about being on campus and having those casual friendly conversations with people and like you said being up until two in the dorm um i mean i i just I, again it's just something i feel really lucky about how do you see like has does what does southern new hampshire what are you planning on doing to try and replicate some of that and and like yeah. maybe what do you see other colleges doing so i think you and i are talking about actually the two jobs the campuses do mm -hmm. and i want to separate them for a moment because parents and students actually separate them. And, you, and I'll explain why I say this. So one job is give me this amazing academic experience that will unlock opportunities in my life and give me a meaningful career, et cetera. Right? Mm -hmm. we, we all kind of get that. And that's, a, that's why you go to college. But in fact, there's a second job and a lot of students you know, covet the second job. And it's this kind of coming of age developmental experience. And yes, of course, they're connected and they're tied. And the best schools, they're really deeply tied. But for a lot of people, they're pretty separate as well. And what does that coming of age experience include? It means I finally, you know, get my independence. I'm off from under my parents. I'm, you know, living in an intentional community. Uh, it's one I've bought into. You know, I did all those tours. What was I doing? I was saying, is this the place I want to spend the next four years? Mm -hmm. um, it's where I grow up. It's where I get to get involved in organizations. It's where I get to reinvent myself. For some people, it's where I get to find myself. It's the place where you get to study abroad. Like, you know, it's the place that transforms your life. Mm -hmm. And of course it's connected to academics and academics can do that too. But so can they know that I think, you know, I, my wife and I, we are our big primary thing to which we give uh, our support is a fund to help Pell Grant students do study abroad because study abroad actually has lots of extra expense. But I think it's one of the most life-changing experiences you can have. And we get letters from the students we support every year when they get back. And, you know, you get this kid from small town New Hampshire who gets dropped into Florence. Mm -hmm. And the world just changes. The world is never the same again. It's so impactful. So, so that's what a campus does as well. So the, the tuition rebellion you're seeing, right, where campuses are saying, we're going to be wholly online, but we're going to cut your tuition 10%. Mm -hmm. And families like, 10% is not good enough. And mm -hmm. the minute they say that, what they're saying is there's some dollar value they place on academics and there's some dollar value they place on coming of age. It's mm -hmm. very hard to know what's what, but that second job is pretty, va pretty valuable. And so now to go to your question, there's a chunk of that we cannot do online. I can't put you in a dorm, mm -hmm. right? I can't put you in an environment where you're only surrounded, not only, but generally surrounded by people of your age. And you know, I can't give you the party on Saturday night. Um, I can't get you, I can't, I don't think I can, I probably shouldn't be there, try to do this online, you can do this on your own, but I can't get you the falling in love experience when you know, see that guy or that girl, like, wow, like, right? Like, it's all of it, that's college. But we can give you really robust support. Um, part of what happens in a campus is a sense of belonging. So we're gonna to try to think about that. If you think about uh, who often has the best campus experiences are those who find strong affinity groups so if you look at the research, it's athletes, it's sorority and fraternity members, it's you know, student government members. So can we, can we get that kind of stickiness for students mm -hmm. even in a distant way? Yeah, our experience with adults, now that's a different population because our big online operations mostly adult learners, non-traditional age. But you really have to think about that. You also have to think about things like mental health, right? So we took a generation of college students with the highest level, like historically high levels, of uh, anxiety and depression we just gave them a pandemic and a recession civil unrest not a great recipe right um so you know can we bolster our mental health supports so i have lots of colleagues who have been calling me over the summer saying what are the things i should be asking we're going to be online what do we need to do and then they tend to ask 80 percent of their questions tend to be around the academic program i keep saying you know what you have great faculty and they're going to they're so committed they're going to get that mostly right they'll figure it out it won't be great all the time but they're going to be really diligent about it mm -hmm. but you're not asking enough questions about everything else it's the everything else that's also part of college and you really have to think hard about that um and it's complicated mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. right college kids are up at two in the morning is there anyone answering the phone 
<laughs> if someone runs into tech support, right? What happens if someone's in crisis? You know, there's no RA's door to knock on. Um, how do you? How are you thinking about that? And then again, how are you thinking about that sense of belonging? Mm -hmm. So are so you're still figuring that out? I imagine that's not oh, something God, that yeah. there's yeah. a whole task force now. They, we are lucky. They are lucky, in that they have this big, robust, sophisticated online operation that's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. So they're pulling in a lot of their colleagues to say, okay. We've all, always only ever done this on campus. What do we need to know? Like, how are you guys doing this piece? How are you doing that piece? Mm -hmm. And the reason you wouldn't just sort of port it over is that the average age of an online student is 28. 86% mm -hmm. of them are working full time. Most of them have kids. 16% are veterans. Like, they don't have the same needs. Like, they've had all the coming of age they can handle. Right, they know what they're about. Like, I'm good. I got coming of age all taken care of. Mm -hmm. So we can learn a lot, but it's not just of flipping a switch and saying, we'll just use your services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And it, it occurs to me that a lot of colleges haven't, I, I don't know, I don't know that I've heard a lot of colleges asking or talking about that as much. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of it's, interesting. So well, I can say it's kind of where you're going to win or lose the game, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, I think students will want a better academic experience than many of them got in the spring, which was uneven, but that was hasty. Everyone will, yeah. everyone will be given the benefit of the doubt for that. So they want that to be better. Um, but if they have, if that's all they have, it's not going to be great. Mm -hmm. If you give them that and enough of that sense of community, enough of that sense of belonging, enough support, it'll get them through this year. I mean, next year, with a little bit of luck, you're hoping for spring. I'd be happy if we get there by summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be back, right? We'll be back. Mm -hmm. um, but this will be this will be a challenging year. Mm -hmm. I think that is really important too, because I have had multiple conversations. I mean, as you said, the, there's a qualitative. Uh, parents and students are kind of assigning a number, and why should they pay all this extra money if they're not going to be on campus? If they're not getting that full experience? So I think yeah. that that is a big question for people. And it's funny because it's not room and board, right? Like room and board, they're not going to pay. But mm -hmm. that's how that's where you sleep and that's where you eat. But under tuition and fees, we put both these jobs. So it's hard to unpack them. If mm -hmm. you unpack them and said, our academic program is X dollars and our coming of age is Y dollars, you would actually test the value of each of those, mm -hmm. like what people would be willing to pay. And I think we might be surprised. And you hear this, right? People are saying, look, I want a good academic program. So it's not saying it's not important, but what they're willing to pay versus what they're willing to pay for this other thing that's that's an interesting piece mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is interesting and when i'm on the phone calls with them they sometimes they want me to have all the answers and i'm like i can tell you even the colleges don't have all the answers right now yeah. so we're just going to need to keep like communicating and and figuring this out so yep uh, absolutely yeah all right so um we're going to go ahead and take a short break and then dr paula blanc and i will continue to talk about challenges and opportunities in higher education under COVID-19.